What is America's role in a multipolar world and how can thinking about history and the history of America or the United States of America, North America, help us understand that or think about or reorient, reorient, change even that uh, the approach America takes to the other nations of the world to what extent can it help America accept equality of nations amongst the world rather than global dominance of the rest of the world? They are the kind of questions that I am going to address in this video on the channel, the Burning Archive channel, uh, in response to a great set of viewer questions. Uh, that I've received. Now, my name's Jeff Rich. I uh, produce the Burning Archive YouTube channel and podcast, and I also write a uh, weekly newsletter, Seven Glimpses of the Multipolar World at jeffrich.substack.com. You can subscribe to that for free. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, one of the viewers on the, and subscribers to the uh, Burning Archive YouTube channel, uh, Ignorance is Bliss, a uh, great name, uh, asked me a set of questions. And if this is something I think I'd like to do a little bit more of on the channel, uh, so if you like that idea, why don't you give this video a like and subscribe to the channel and even leave us a few comments below about the kind of questions you'd like me to address about history and the multipolar world on this channel. Well, let's read what Ignorance is Bliss. He uh, wrote, America has blurred the lines when it comes to many subjects, history being the most difficult to disentangle. We are not taught to think multidimensional or multipolar, and it has been extremely bias-driven. Propaganda has been harmful and divisive to the general public. I've researched on my own and with much ridicule, and that's sad to hear, but be strong. Keep making up your own mind about things. I have many questions and my curiosity is not limited. Fantastic curiosity is a great strength. I worry for my country as I know we are in the pitfall. And uh, Ignorance is Bliss asked eight questions, which were, who was native to America before colonialism? And he noted that the debate, or Ignorance is Bliss noted the debate is ongoing here. Secondly, why did Europeans settle in America? Uh, the real reason for separating, some countries say religious freedom, some say extremism. What was the role America played in World War II? How was it settled? And did America glorify themselves or something naughty? <laughs> it, question four, is America the bully? Question five, is a, a one world organization reasonable? NATO, the World Economic Forum, maybe. How, question six, how can we open the minds of Americans to the multipolar world? Question seven, is Western culture appropriate to other cultures and civilizations? Question eight, would America be considered racist? Noting that uh, Biden hasn't had the best speeches and this issue is constantly brought up in schools and media. Now, I'm going to try to give some reasonably quick responses to each of these questions, which are great questions, and I might even come back to some of these questions in later videos, because some of them are quite interesting and profound. And uh, Ignorance is Bliss also asked more generally, I guess, about American decline, I guess, which is something I've addressed on the podcast previously. Uh, and I'll include links to those podcast episodes below. But it's also a question uh, I covered in my uh, pre la latest uh, video, which was a review of Vladislav Zubok's book, Collapse the Fall of the Soviet Union, because there is a direct question raised at the end of Vladislav Zubok's book about whether 
the United States of America, the Western Liberal Democratic political order, could suffer a similar kind of um, sudden change in fortune. So these are great questions, great questions really relevant to so many of the debates being discussed today. Let's have a look at each of these eight questions in turn. So first of all, who was native to America before colonialism? And look, I'm not entirely sure of all the debate uh, around uh, this that uh, ignorance is bliss is referring to, but uh, and I may well come back to this topic in another video, but broadly as I understand it, there were groups that crossed over from North East Asia, uh, crossed the Bering Strait and down into America uh, at some point, you know, 30, 20,000 years ago. And that uh, the, uh, the uh, spread uh, of these peoples uh, through the continent, their, opula uh, their, their ultimate population of the whole two continents of North and South America, and um, uh, how and why and in what form that that spread happened and how things developed over time is, you know, to some degree, what is much debated, and this is partly a debate driven by different archaeological findings and the different explanations of them. Uh, and then particularly there's a, a cave, the Blue Fish Caves, where I think they've ra radio dated uh, some, you know, remains uh, that go back to 24,000 years ago. But what's not clear is what the diff And there's all sorts of new emerging scientific analyses that uh, postulate different theories of you know, how and when things spread. Uh, but similarly, there's also a broad periodization, I guess, of the different um, periods of the spread and the culture with uh, uh, more or less developed societies in different parts of America at different times. Uh, some of these uh, are covered in Felipe Fernandez Amesto's terrific book, Civilizations, that I've also done a video on. Uh, but they're also covered uh, to some degree in the book by Charles Mann, 1491, that looks at North American societies immediately prior to the sort of Colombian uh, encounter. Uh, now, I haven't read Charles Mann's 1491, but it's a much-praised book, so uh, I might come back to this topic in another time. Uh, but I guess it's partly... Uh, it's also worth noting that those pre-colonial societies were uh, persistent and competitive for some time. Uh, in fact there was quite a degree of evolution of some of those societies afterwards. There was catastrophes in some, but also resilience in others. And that's a question we might come back to. Second question from Ignorance is Bliss is, why did Europeans settle in America? Is it, uh, it Was it the refuge of um, nonconformist religious dissenters? Was it exploitation of resources. Uh, well, I mean, broadly, Europeans settled in America because it was part of the 15th or 16th century breakout of Europe from the, you know, the, the far western peninsula of Eurasia to the rest of the world, the explorers from Portugal and Spain and other countries moving out to the world and establishing uh, various forms of um, uh, exploitation of the resources of the rest of the world. And uh, so the Pilgrim story is really just one strand of that story. 
Uh, and I think it's good to recognise that it wasn't just the British who settled in America. It was Europeans. There were British colonies. There were French colonies. There were Dutch colonies. And especially there were Spanish colonies. Uh, and I think it's really important. And there's actually a great book about this by Felipe Fernandez Armesto, a, a great book about this called Our America, A Hispanic History of the United States. It really describes how, if you like, there was a, a warp and a weft, a sort of the, you know, the, the vertical and the horizontal uh, weaving of different cultural strands in the history of America. The British colonies... Um, formed on the uh, east coast and gradually moved west. And the Spanish colonies formed in Mexico and California and Florida and, uh, and other places and gradually moved north. And uh, so, so this story of Hispanic settlement and cultural and political and social influence on America is very much often uh, left out of the settlement story. So I'd highly recommend people read uh, that book by Felipe Fernandez Armesto. The third question Ignorance is Bliss asked is what was the role America played in World War II? And this is a huge story. Uh, we've all been, uh, those of us in uh, you know, I guess Western liberal democratic countries have all been uh, under the sort of cultural influence of Hollywood, uh, being bombarded with American uh, World War II movies ever since we were little children. It is really that re those that that culture presents a totally well an exaggerated role of America's role in World War II, or a distorted, let's say, a distorted image of America's role in World War II. America did not win the war. It was certainly a party to winning the war, but it's important to remember that uh, 25 to 30 million Russians or Soviet citizens died in World War II, defending, uh, de defending and defeating and ex ultimately expelling the German uh, occupiers of the Soviet Union, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the Germans were surrounding Moscow and besieging Leningrad before America even entered the war, and also that uh, China played a crucial role in World War II, that there were, I think it's 14 million uh, Chinese citizens died in World War II, and that the uh, China-Japan War really started World War II back in 1938. That was a video I did. Uh, certainly America played a really crucial role in the Pacific theatre, uh, I guess a crucial role particularly for Australia in the Pacific theatre, and it was the economic victor of the war, but it is really important to uh, separate away, separate from the myths that people tell, particularly in Britain and uh, the United States of America, about the role uh, that, that, that provide a very distorted lens on the events of World War II. Uh, so I might well come back to that uh, these days because World War II is... Uh, I might come back to that another day on the channel when I've done a little bit more reading on it because World War II is a, a part of the historical mythology, I guess, of, of uh, the West today and it is um, it is constantly used in in various other disputes around um, 
the multipolar world, the whole idea of World War Three, I guess, being the next iteration of World War II. Fourth question is, is America the bully? Well, yes. <laughs> I think Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was recently quoted saying that no one likes a bully. Uh, I don't know whether that was in relationship to China or to Russia, but um, skillful diplomacy as ever from Anthony Blinken because uh, America, I think, uh, does count as a bully. Uh, there have been so many examples of that, perhaps. The, the record of NATO aggression in Serbia and uh, Eastern Europe and Libya, etc., and Syria is is uh, um, and Afghanistan and Iraq is perhaps amongst that. But I think one of the most compelling things I've seen in a uh, recent couple of years has been a study that was uh, promoted on a Quincy Institute uh, video, an academic study which you can uh, follow up, and I'll include links on below that actually studied statistically the frequency of. Uh, American involvement or initiation of wars, military uh, conflicts, aggression, yeah, military interventions, uh, through the entire course of the United States independent history all the way back to 1776. And I think this led to the extraordinary and stark conclusion that I think there's only been like a dozen or so years in the United States' entire history in which it has not initiated military interventions. It was certainly late into World War I and late into World War II, but uh, that is not because of its track record of loving peace. It's rather perhaps a question of when is it most to American advantage. And what is most extraordinary about this study is that it showed that the frequency and the number of military interventions has actually from America has actually increased since the uh, the fall of uh the, you know the the clap the 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 end of the cold war in 1989 america has a very uh bad reputation in the rest of the world for coercive diplomacy and the sort of um uh, blindness to its own um uh, delusions of grandeur and its aggression. Uh, that at least is my my perspective. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely see America as the bully. And I think uh, the next few years are going to be interesting because I think the world is starting to stand up to the bully and we will see how that, where that all takes us. Hopefully it won't destroy us all. Uh, okay, so the next uh, question, I think it's question number five, is, is a one-world organisation reasonable, like NATO or the World Economic Forum? Well, I'd say yes and no. Uh, let's do yes first. Well, I mean, we do have a single world organisation to a, a, a single institution providing governance across the world, and that is the United Nations. It's certainly an imperfect organisation, and it doesn't in any way seek to be uh, like a one-world government, like a, a single, integrated, comprehensive uh uh, controlling state for the entire world, um, but it is a form of uh, government. It is a form of organisation. It is a form of structured governance in which all the states and territories of the world can come together and work through in accordance with international law and decent, um, uh, through dialogue and diplomacy, 
the various disputes and issues between them. Uh, And perhaps understanding what the limits of such governance are uh, is important to do, but all forms of governance have limits, even ones, you know, uh, like when you think about your national government, there are things it can and cannot do in terms of resolving disputes between people. There are limits to its power. So the same, I guess, reasonable set of expectations should be applied to the United Nations. And I think perhaps... Uh, perhaps we should lean into the United Nations as it was more originally conceived and not as, as it has um, operated perhaps in, since 1989 um, would be a good thing. Then in terms of no, well, I certainly think uh, NATO. NATO is an Atlantic alliance it's basically the justification for continued military involvement for the United States in Europe and other parts of the world. I think it would be a disastrous, it is a disastrous thing that NATO is even thinking about extending into the Indo-Pacific. Absolutely terrible. So NATO is a partial military alliance. It is not a capa- It's not the basis for world organisation. And similarly, the World Economic Forum is really like a it's like a discussion club for billionaires. Um, it is, uh, and it is one of declining influence. It certainly has some wealthy, self confident uh, voices who are loud and persistent in talking about you know, great resets and world government and all that sort of thing. But I don't think it really has any viability in that form. The whole idea of global government has a really interesting history. And there's actually a great book by a historian, Mark Mazawa, called uh, Governing the World, the History of an Idea, that I will include a link in uh, below uh, that sort of explores the ideas of world government going all the way back to Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher from the, uh, or Prussian uh, philosopher from the uh, sort of late 18th century, um, uh, and, and others that have developed that idea. And But I think, I think we have to also accept that... Uh, 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 any form of world organisation needs to be loose, looser and accommodate multiple civilizations, multiple political orders, multiple states, multiple powers. It needs to be a multipolar world organisation, not a liberal rules-based American rules-based order. Question number six is how can we open the minds of Americans to the multipolar world? Uh, and look, uh, it's interesting, the former Singaporean diplomat, Kishore Mabubani, who's written some fabulous books about the rise of China and Asian sort of approach to diplomacy and generally geopolitics. Uh, I think he was formerly the uh, Singaporean ambassador to the United Nations, so he speaks from both a, like a, a very well-informed, educated point of view, but also a very practically grounded, like, uh, you know, actually dealing with uh, diplomats and competing states. He has recently uh, written a piece uh, where he talks about the astonishing insularity of American culture that he 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 sort of um, would, you know, turn on the television in a a hotel room in America, he, like even today, and is just amazed at how how America doesn't really see the world outside of its own boundaries. And uh, uh, I think one of the things Americans perhaps need to do, uh, and maybe the the growing presence of other cultures and other countries on the internet might help Americans do is to uh, realise 
how insular Americans can seem to the rest of the world. But I think one of the other things Americans can do to uh, open their minds to the multipolar world is to uh, look, begin by looking at its own multipolar past. Now, in response to the question about uh, why did Europeans settle, uh, again, I emphasise the fact that there were multiple strands of Europeans who settled, uh, that, that there is that Hispanic influence on America, there is that um, British influence on America, there, is the, uh, there was the persistent uh, strength of many of the uh, Native American um, empires, which actually, you know, developed and fought against those settlers to some degree with significant success and innovation and resisted their, their conquest. Uh, there's the French influence. There's the uh, Dutch influence. There's the influence of uh, the extraordinary migrations that occurred through the 19th century. There is the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the the long presence of African Americans in America. So America actually has of oh, this a Chinese and Japanese influence uh, as well, uh, gold rushes and all that sort of thing as well. So America actually has a multipolar past. It should sort of maybe let go of some of the more monochrome Hollywood sort of versions of its history and see that multipolar past so it can be not so much great again as humble again amongst its fellow members of the multipolar world. So that's kind of what I'd, I'd recommend. And Felipe Fernandez Amesto's book, uh, our America, uh, Hispanic History of America, is a fabulous start for that. Um, but I think also just uh, listening to the voices in America that don't flatter American greatness, there's just so much obsession with American greatness in America, I think. I think it really... Uh, I think... I think Take, walking more humbly on the earth is the way in which America can open its minds to the multipolar world. So the seventh question is, is Western culture appropriate to other cultures and civilizations? And uh, again, I think uh, I, I, it's really important to, I think one of the great contributions to my thinking by the historian Felipe Fernandez Amesto is to think of to think of civilization as a process rather than an entity, and uh, and also of culture as incredibly mutable and changeable. And I think if you do that, then you don't um, fall into the trap of turning uh, Western civilization, Russian civilization, Chinese civilization, you know, uh, uh, Muslim civilization, Hindu, uh, Hindu or Indian civilization into these kind of fixed entities that are clashing with each other in the world. It's not to deny that there's conflict in the world, but that there has always been exchange and learning and engagement between cultures uh, from all around the world. And uh, a couple of weeks ago on my in my Substack newsletter, I actually wrote a short piece about uh, the Indian or Bengali writer Rabindranath. Tagore, who won the Nobel Prize in 1913, and he was actually the first non-Westerner to win the Nobel Prize. And he uh, was a fierce critic of the British Empire and of nationalism in general, uh, 
but he also uh, never wanted to sort of renounce, if you like, uh, to, to say that he, he never wanted to cancel Western civilization, Western culture. In fact, he saw that idea as inimical to really uh, a more humane and accepting and generous embrace of all the cultural traditions of the multipolar world, all the wisdom traditions of the world. He very much spurned a narrow single civilizational view, a narrow patriotic nationalism and express gratitude for all the expressions of human culture. And he wrote, whatever we understand and enjoy in human products instantly becomes ours, wherever they might have their origin. I am proud of my humanity when I can acknowledge the poets and artists of other countries as my own. Uh, let me feel as my own. Let me feel with unalloyed gladness that all the great glories of humanity are mine. Therefore, it hurts me deeply when the cry of rejection rings loud against the West in my country with the clamour that Western education can only injure us. And I really feel that that uh, attitude is the thing to embrace. It's uh, not the attitude of a clash of civilization or, or you know, the, the, the pride in Western civilization alone or whatever your uh, alternative is. It's rather um, to embrace uh, the... Uh, uh, embrace the diversity of civilizations, embrace the prospect that all those civilizations can contribute to our lives, our culture, our history as a symphony of civilizations. So ignorance is bliss's final question is, would America be considered racist? And um, I... Personally, I find the term racist is used a little bit too much and with a little bit too little specificity. America certainly has, uh, in the views of the rest of the world, some attitudes that are uh, supremacist almost, let's say, uh, rather than racist. And uh, I think uh, there's an element there where it's a little bit of the arrogance of the golden billion. It's insular, it's ill-informed, um, but I would not say it's racist, although at, and that's not a comment on, I guess, the internal social divisions, the legacy of those social divisions within America. But I think America as such is uh, is not racist like all countries. It has a difficult and tragic history and it has done some good things to do around that. I think the great problem for America is its, its insular and supremacist attitudes to the rest of the world. It should really embrace the diversity of civilizations. It should follow... Rabindranath Tagore's advice, it should look at forming a symphony of civilizations. And that is certainly what I hope to be able to contribute to here on the Burning Archive channel by telling stories of the rich histories, cultures, traditions of the multipolar world. Uh, never been um, naive, I guess, about uh, some of the dark histories, the difficult histories that uh, so many civilizations do have, but also trying to look for how uh, all that culture can uh, be embraced and contribute to, so that, uh, as Ezra Pound 
said what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee. Now, if there are questions that you would like me to address uh, and think, let me thank Ignorance is Bliss for your great questions. I hope I've been able to answer them. And there are links below with some of the books and references that I've uh, talked about. Um, but uh, if there are questions you'd like to ask, like Ignorance is Bliss has asked uh, and you'd like me to respond to, leave us a comment below. Uh, and also, why don't you also subscribe to my Substack? That's jeffrich.substack.com. And there you'll be able to uh, hear from me each week about glimpses of the multipolar world across history, politics, and culture. And you'll also find out how you can support me by upgrading your subscription to Substack and by my books and other content. So thanks so much, and I'll see you in my next video.